Hey, Happy New Year's. You want to talk about the end of the world? Imagine, if you will, the ancient Mediterranean. Sometime around 1200 BCE. To the south, the Egyptian kingdoms have reigned for hundreds of years. While to the east, the Fertile Crescent boasts its own array of empires. The Akkadians, the Trojans, the Lydians. On Crete, the largest island in the area, the Minoans wax great. And in the north, the Mycenaeans, what we might call Proto-Greeks, built architectural marvels. And then... A brutal wave of destruction topples city after city. Entire civilizations collapse, leaving gaps up to 400 years in the archaeological record, where we just don't know what happened. Even the descendants of the survivors know so little about what happened that they can only mythologize their past. The Trojan War... Ruins so great they think a cyclops must have built them. Modern scholars are flummoxed by the abrupt Dark Ages. Until archaeologists find this one inscription in Egypt. It mentions an invasion by a group of tribes, this unstoppable coalition. The names are so unfamiliar that historians just start calling them the Sea Peoples. But who are the Sea Peoples? Where did they come from? And could they really have made such a devastating impact all around the civilizations of the Eastern Aegean? What caused this collapse? Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today I want to talk about the Bronze Age Collapse, the Sea Peoples, and the funny way that drama and simplicity can blind us to the truth. Before we dive too far in, though, I'd just like to introduce my main source for this topic. Eric H. Klein's 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. This comes highly recommended by my fellow scholars in ancient Mediterranean studies. It's kind of the book on the subject. And while of course it's not perfect, it does a really nice job of laying out what evidence there is, what the various theories are, and giving all of it a really good analysis. It's accessible, I think, to non-scholars as well. And I'd say if you're interested, go ahead and check it out. The warriors entered the world scene and moved rapidly, leaving death and destruction in their wake. Modern scholars refer to them collectively as the Sea Peoples, but the Egyptians who recorded their attack on Egypt never used that term, instead identifying them as separate groups working together, the Peleset, Tajekar, Shekeles, Shardana, Danuna, and Weshesh. Now we can break this down a little bit. The Peleset, for instance, are probably the Philistines. They started out on Crete and at some point migrated over to Canaan in the Levant. The Danuna sounds awfully reminiscent of the Homeric word Danaan, which is a name for the Mycenaean Greeks. The rest are less certain, and there are even a few others from another inscription that perhaps should be included here. Now, one reason why we have this ambiguity is that we just don't have these names referenced in other Egyptian sources. But another reason might be that we've misidentified someone somewhere. It happens all the time. Take, for instance, the Minoans. Now, I've mentioned that they are a civilization flourishing at this time on the island of Crete. And if you ask most scholars of the ancient Mediterranean, they'll tell you that Knossos, the palace that is famously the center of Minoan activity on Crete, is their capital. 
that they ruled the whole island, and that their people stretched out into the Cyclades, the islands nearby. But if you take a close look at the art from Knossos, the Minoan art, and the art from ancient Akrotiri, a settlement on the nearest island, Santorini, you'll see that there's actually not that much they have in common. And so we find that the history of historical scholarship is just as important to our understanding of the past as the archaeological record. One scholar or set of scholars' interpretation of the evidence can lead to generations of assumptions about what we're looking at. This is part of why it can be so hard to be really certain about anything this far back. Regardless, we do know from the evidence that Egypt was invaded by some concatenation of peoples in the years surrounding 1200 BC, not once, but twice. And there appears to be evidence of other invasions in places along the coastline, even some places further inland. The Egyptian inscription also tells us that these people were unstoppable in the other places they had attacked, though that may just be a bit of bragging since Egypt stopped them. Certainly, we know that many cities fell in the decades surrounding the turn of the century. Here's the map that Klein gives of all the cities in the ancient eastern Mediterranean that fell in these years. As you can see, it's a rather wide range. Could a single group of marauders, even one made up of many disparate peoples, really have caused such a broad swath of destruction without leaving more clues? And why continue their raids for so many years, maybe even multiple generations? Before we can answer that, I think we need a better picture of what life was really like then and there. We tend to think of ancient civilizations as bubbles, isolated from one another by geography, by lack of technology, by xenophobia. And if that were the case, then surely it wouldn't be too hard for roving Viking-style bands to go after one city at a time and take them down. But the evidence shows us a very different view of the world. Let's take this example that Klein gives of a shipwreck found off of the coast of Turkey. It dates back to about 1300 BCE, so roughly within our time period. It's a trade vessel, the Ulubarun ship, and so it should give us a pretty clear picture of what trade networks were in operation at the time. Not only were there goods from at least seven different areas, but judging from the personal possessions the archaeologists found in the shipwreck, there were also at least two Mycenaeans on board, even though this seems to have been a Canaanite ship. Clearly, this ship does not belong to a world of isolated civilizations, kingdoms, and fiefdoms, but rather to an interconnected world of trade, migration, and, alas, war. This really was the first truly global age. Even in this one admittedly fairly spectacular shipwreck, we can see that the ancient Mediterranean was not a series of disconnected city-states, but an international community, connected by trade, by communication, and by marriage. I think maybe Klein is exaggerating a little bit when he calls it global, but humanity as a whole doesn't really change, and we have always been a species who push boundaries, cross barriers, and communicate. Archaeologists who study the material culture of this time period are used to tracing lines of exchange to find out where the trade connections were, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it was more than just the pottery that we can still see. We have records of kings marrying foreign princesses, sons sent abroad, 
intangible goods being traded at a low level that we can no longer detect and more. It truly was an interconnected and interdependent economy. So what happens when disaster strikes in such a world? Well, sometimes, for sure, people go to war, and it doesn't take the Sea Peoples to cause battle. But marriage alliances and trade alliances tend to enforce some level of status quo. And then on top of that, there is people's need, no less then than now, to help each other. We have record, for instance, of a famine across the Hittite lands that was ameliorated by shipments of grain from Egypt. So why the disruption of this resilient international trade network? Could it have simply been raids by the Sea Peoples? Klein goes through his list of cities that fell during this period and examines the evidence for why they collapsed. Some definitely show signs of fire and weapon damage, the kind of thing that you would expect to see if a city fell in battle. But not all of them. Some of the others show the tilted walls and broken floors of earthquake damage, and the geological record shows that a series of shocks did go through the area at that time. Still others were simply abandoned, possibly due to climate change. That famine I mentioned earlier was likely to have been caused by a series of droughts. And some places seem to have simply rebelled against their leaders, making the grand architecture of monumental buildings no longer worthwhile. One disaster a city or country might weather. After all, this interconnected community probably made them fairly resilient. But a series of small problems hitting different parts of the network all around the same time, well, that can add up to calamity pretty fast. A. Clearly, there were earthquakes during this period, but usually societies can recover from these. B. There was textual evidence for famine, and now scientific evidence for droughts and climate change in both the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. But again, societies have recovered from these time and time again. C. There may be circumstantial evidence for internal rebellions in Greece and elsewhere, including the Levant, although this is not certain. Again, societies frequently survive such revolts. D. There is archaeological evidence for invaders, or at least newcomers. Some of the cities were destroyed and then abandoned. Others were reoccupied, and still others were unaffected. E. It is clear that the international trade routes were affected, if not completely cut off, for a period of time, but the extent to which this would have impacted the various individual civilizations is not altogether clear. So to return to our initial question of who are the Sea People, Klein posits that they may well be made up of refugees from these various disasters, natural and otherwise. I also think it's fairly likely that they include some of the people from smaller islander nations that we don't generally recognize. With everyone in the area bound up in this web together of alliance and trade, yes, they could support each other through tough times, but once people start getting truly displaced and trade is disrupted and cities are entirely gone, well, those interdependencies could become a weak point. And with everything spiraling, low-level system collapse in each part might bring each individual civilization to unsustainable decline. So is this how a civilization, or a set of civilizations, collapses? We see this in the constant rise and fall of empires over time, including the Akkadians, Assyrians, Macedonians, Romans, 
Mongols, Ottomans, and others. And we should not think that our current world is invulnerable, for we are, in fact, more susceptible than we think. Klein's book came out in 2014, and he spent some space at the end of it comparing our modern globalized economy and the stock market crash of 2008 to the Bronze Age collapse. It's not hard to see why. In our hugely interconnected world, we depend on each other more than ever, and letting one market fail can drag the rest down. I think it's even more true now, we can see the impact that an isolationist, capitalist response to global health has had on our own lives. It's amazingly absurd and hypocritical that people blame countries for developing variants when we're the ones who denied them the vaccine that could have stopped it. Climate change is coming for us. It brings not only fire, flood, and famine, but plague. We're only going to get through this together. If the end comes, it's not going to be because of an invasion of climate refugees. It's going to be because of the systems that fail to support them and each other. Because, you see, they're wasn't really a Bronze Age collapse. There wasn't an end of civilizations, not really. Cities fell, lives were lost, earthquake and fire and famine and sea peoples. But while empires fell, life went on. Many cities that fell were simply rebuilt elsewhere where it was more hospitable to human life. Some places simply adopted the refugees. Others rejected their top-down hierarchical civilizations and relied more on community-based agrarianism. Trade was disrupted, but it reformed. We don't even know what the extent of trade being disrupted was, since most of the tangible goods that remain in the archaeological record were really only things that the elites cared about. We may have lost a chunk of history as we see it, but humanity lived on. Much like the fall of the Roman Empire, the Bronze Age collapse was less of a collapse and more of an adaptation. A disruption that resulted in changes that leveled the playing field and allowed the Visigoths, I mean the Sea Peoples, to survive in a world that was changing around them. This is where Klein and I differ. To use his own metaphor, Klein sees the end of the Bronze Age Mediterranean civilizations as a controlled burn in an old growth forest that allows the hardy trees to continue to grow and keeps the status quo. But I think it's even less of a collapse than that. Change is not necessarily loss. And the new civilizations that grew didn't just rebuild the old ways, but brought new things into the world. Human culture is not teleological. We do not live in the best, most enlightened, and most omniscient of all times. What looked to us like Dark Ages might well have been a vibrant and flourishing era. If you want an argument for the medieval Dark Ages along the same lines, check out this book, The Bright Ages, by Perry and Gabrielle. Stories are wonderful things. They can bring us together, help us to understand and empathize with people from times and places beyond our ken. But when it comes to human beings, a simple, easily understood story is rarely entirely true. 
the story of the sea peoples raiding and destroying civilizations across the eastern Mediterranean, it has everything you could want. Action, adventure, flash, drama, mystery. I even bought into it myself for quite a long time. But in the end, the truth is even more relatable than that. We're living through a version of it right now. Humanity as a whole doesn't really change. And we want those simple narratives. We crave the reassurance that it couldn't happen here, not now, not to us. But it is happening, and it's not simple. We, in our way of life, are killing our environment and destroying our own trade networks. There will be no systems left to support us if we continue down this path. And, unless it is too late for other reasons, when the apocalypse comes, it won't be with a bomb. It will be a series of seemingly disconnected system failures that lead to the fall of civilization as we know it, and an adaptation to our new environment in ways that are more sustainable. Not with a bang, but an embrace. Keep learning, friends. <laughs>